Good evening. Uh, I am Dr. Brian Orr. I am a friend of David Rathel's, and he asked if I wanted to do a lecture for you guys, and I'm delighted to. So first I want to say thank you, uh, Dr. David Rathel, for inviting me. And then he asked me what I want to do it on, and I said probably one of my favorite topics is the doctrine of divine simplicity. So I know it's, it's a very obscure uh, doctrine. I know that's uh, kind of frowned upon by a lot of people, uh, especially evangelicals, but it actually is experiencing a, a resurgence of sorts among classical theists, uh, reformed, reformed theists, that kind of thing. So uh, I think it's a great time to, especially in seminary, to, to go through it because it's really important to understand why we say God is simple. So <clears throat> I'll go ahead and get started. Uh, but oh, real, sorry, real quick about me. Uh, I'm a pastor, uh, Sovereign Way Christian Church in Hesperia. Uh, I completed my PhD at the London School of Theology under Paul Helm and Tony Lane. Really, really great, uh, great men that uh, were so, so helpful in my study. So uh, all that to say, I actually just got awarded my PhD in September, so it's, it's pretty new for me. Um, I did my dissertation on, uh, I, I offered a, a critique of the evangelical process theology of Thomas J. Ord. So it's a lot, it's a mouthful, but... Uh, Thomas Ord is definitely a upcoming name in the evangelical kind of Protestant stream. He has some views on God that are kind of catching a lot of attention. He has a, a book that he published a couple of years ago that has become very popular. And right now it's escaping my name, but I'll grab it at the end. But anyway, his name is Thomas J. Ord. So, okay, now I'll now we'll get started. Now I'll we'll get started. So, all right. Here's the question. Does God have a body? Sounds pretty easy. Like, no, he doesn't have a body, right? I mean, to sum it up, we're going to read what Moses writes in Deuteronomy 4, 15 to 16. He says, diligently watch yourselves because you did not see any form on the day the Lord spoke to you out of the fire at Horeb. So you don't act corruptly and make an idol for yourselves in the shape of any figure, a male or female form. And if you recall, what did Jesus say to the woman at the well? He said, God is spirit, and those who worship him must worship in spirit and truth. So no form, God is a spirit, so doesn't have a doesn't have a body, right? And then we go to the historic teachings of the Christian faith in our creeds. Very early on, the Nicene Creed. I'm going to kind of skip to the bottom of it, but he says, speaking of God, he says, begotten, not made, of the same essence as the Father. And the Athanasian Creed, written around the, the 6th century, Right, it goes, neither blending their persons nor dividing their essence, but the divinity of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit is one. And yet there are not three eternal beings, but there is one eternal being. So too there are not three uncreated or immeasurable beings, there is but one uncreated immeasurable being. In the well-known confessions in the Reformed tradition, which is probably more familiar to you guys, would be the Westminster Confession of Faith, and the London Baptist Confession of Faith, excuse me. Very early on, this is what they write. They're both pretty much identical, so I'll just read the Westminster Confession. It says, There is but one only living and true God, who is infinite in being and perfection, a most pure spirit, invisible, without body, parts. Now, the affirmation that God does not have a body seems to be very basic and very orthodox, right? Well, yes and no. If we're that simple... We wouldn't be having a lecture dedicated to doctrine of divine simplicity. Excuse me. And if that's simple, we wouldn't see so much scholarly attention today to that subject. And I'm giving you a hint as to why. If you heard what I said back in the Westminster Confession of Faith, I said, without body and then parts. Right. So the, there's a comma there. So it's without body, comma, parts. So the confession says that God doesn't have a body and he doesn't have parts. So the thing is, what's been a problem over time is that people understand that God doesn't have a body, but they don't understand to confess that he does not have parts. Usually they just said, they just, uh, we just mean if we say God doesn't have parts, we mean God doesn't have body parts. But that's, that's not the discussion. It's, it's clear. He doesn't have a body and he doesn't have a part. So the question is, why does it matter? What's important about it? And I'll, I'll have to say, Honestly, the, the, the divinity of God is at stake in this argument, so it's very, very important. So the challenges against simplicity are many, and here are a few of them. That it's, it makes God too abstract, right? Too abstract. 
Um, oh, fix real quick. He doesn't sound personable. He sounds too unknowable. It makes God a, a property uh, and identical to all his properties. And you'll see later on at the very end, I'll talk about more what that means. Um, and we lose our ability to even speak about his attributes. It obscures the incarnation. It negates God's freedom. And ultimately, how does it sustain the doctrine of the Trinity? And at the end of the day, I, th I think it's unbiblical, right? But challenges aside, what will be argued in this lecture is that simplicity is a formal feature of divinity. It's not just an attribute, right? Though even the early reformers would say it's an attribute, and yes, we do say it. But God's simplicity, it is his ontological constitution. Just for his creatures, our ontological constitution is compositeness, right? We are made up of parts, okay? So to cast away simplicity is to cast away his divinity and so the worshipfulness of God. And again, my aim here is to show that simplicity as an integral aspect of the doctrine of God, showing that it can be reconciled with his other attributes in a sustained and cogent manner. So to kind of give you the outline of the rest of the, of the lecture, so obviously I've given the introduction about, about God having a body or not, right? So we're going to go through the, the classical doctrine, divine simplicity, and we're going to also see a few of the, of the, the triple A's, I call them, the triple A's. So um, Augustine, Anselm, and Aquinas. Uh, we're going to understand about what they viewed on, on, the, on this matter in a very, again, a very superficial level, very kind of flyby, okay? We're also going to understand simplicity and the Trinity, understanding how that works, but that's a very important piece of it. And at the end, though it's kind of backwards, I'm going to give you the biblical foundation for the doctrine of divine simplicity and show you what doctrines actually we kind of pull from the text to substantiate our doctrine of divine simplicity. So, so I'm going to go back to, again, our classical doctrine of divine simplicity. So, <clears throat> excuse me, get some water real quick. So while the doctrine of divine simplicity, I'm going to say uh, DDS going forward, the DDS, it's always a mouthful. So the DDS, got that? Divine simplicity. It has been the, cover, the governing concept and normative assumption in the classical doctrine of God since the time of the church fathers. So we're talking like the first apostolic fathers and you have the Nicene and post-Nicene, you know, all these fathers, that's what the reference to, those fathers. So it's, it's a common teaching, and I don't have time to go through it, but I will say, uh, as I've been surveying through the early church fathers, I'm actually working on a, 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 a Doctrine of God course, the Essence and Attributes, and it's kind of a historical, philosophical, and theological engagement working all the way up from the fathers to show the foundation of divine simplicity in the early church fathers and, and all through really classical theology. Okay, So... But it has become widely rejected in contemporary theology, with some arguing that it should be left in the arid wastelands of scholastic philosophy. So one of the key reasons why the DDS, remember, the DDS, Doctrine of Divine Simplicity, has been on the chopping block is due to the relational strand of theology that has become prominent in contemporary theism. Many modern theologians and philosophers consider God as a, a person or an individual having a consciousness or mind with beliefs and thoughts. And we, we think that way about persons, so it sounds very natural to think that way. However, earlier generations would not have spoken of God in such terms. So the AAA, Augustine and some Aquinas, they assert God does not belong to a class of any sort. So he cannot be a person or individual. Okay? So what they mean is that God belongs to no class at all, and that he defies the conceptual equipment by means of which we identify things and single them out as members of a world. Okay, so one of the issues that's up for debate right now is the understanding of God's transcendence and God's imminence. So the issue is that there's some that say, well, classical theology has made God too transcendent, where there's no imminence with, with God, but that's not the case. It's kind of a, a misunderstanding what that means. All that to say is that God doesn't have body parts. God doesn't have eyes. He doesn't have chemicals in his body. He doesn't have a body, right? So in a sense, that God is outside the core, the category of what we are. If God could be classed, right, then he wouldn't be God. And it's, and it's okay to say that. We can't put bo we can't put God in a box. And that's what, what uh, the, the quote there is meant to say. It is important to observe that the common link uniting the objectors, right, people that have problems with the DDS, is the assumption of a univocal rather than an analogical relationship between God and creation. So let me explain this, okay? And it is, it's inconsistent to understand 
or it's inconsistent to not operate with these ontological distinctions. Okay, so for example, while we speak about God by while what we know about creatures, we tend to blur the lines, and that is the problem. We can blur the lines between the two that produces a tendency toward literal predication about the uncreated in created terms. I would call that strong anthropomorphism, right? So basically saying God has eyes, hands, feet. He doesn't have those things. But the issue is that we know that Scripture uses those to help teach us about God, how we can talk about who he is. But a strong anthropomorphism is kind of blurring those lines and literally giving these attributes to him. So that would be what you call a univocal approach. So when Scripture says God is light or God is love, right? then what a person would say that holds to univocal predication is that we could actually predicate that man is light or man is love. We, we can't do that, right? Now, analogical predication, or the a way of understanding that, it relaxes the ordinary rules of meaning in order to communicate not what God is, but what he is like. Okay, that's very important. If, if we don't have that is and like in our understanding and talking about God, we go very dangerous to blurring the lines, as I said, and making God in a category with creatures. But God is uncreated, right? There is no category for God. If he could be measured, he wouldn't be God. Furthermore, another mistake contemporary critics make is the assumption that simplicity is intended to speak positively about God, right? That's been one of the objectors' claims that we can't use it to say anything about God, right? But we, if we follow the stream of articulation in the triple A's, right, Augustine and Selma Aquinas, right, the obvious fact is that the DDS is a piece of negative or apophatic theology and is not purported to describe anything positive about God. It's not intended to tell us what we should say about God. It's intended, it's intended to tell us what we should not say about God. Make, make sense? It's what you call apophatic theology, speaking negatively, negative statements. Another mistake when it comes to divine simplicity is to view it as just an attribute among attributes. And I already mentioned this, right? However, simplicity is not just an attribute of God. It is the absolute divinity of God from which we can qualitatively predicate a divine attribute of God. It's because he is simple he is transcendent. Those two are together. So when we think simplicity, we think transcendent. Don't think simple as being something that's just simple and small, okay? It has to do with God's constitution of who he is. It's his divinity. And what is divinity? It is transcendent. So transcendence necessitates simplicity and vice versa, right? Because God is completely present and imminent to all of creation as part of his spirituality. So his transcendence necessitates simplicity. And he is imminent because he is transcendent and simple. Okay, so if he were composite, remember composite is our constitution. If he were composite, that means he's made up of parts. He couldn't be transcendent as pure deity is. And so what's the matter with that? If that were the case, he would not be the creator of the universe. So we understand like this. God is immutable because he is simple. God is holy because he is simple. God is eternal because he is simple. God is omniscient because he is simple. So now we're going to get to a classical definition of simplicity. Okay, so though there are other versions of this doctrine, the unitive principle of the DDS negatively predicates. Again, negatively predicates is what this type of language is intended to do, right? So the DDS negatively predicates that God is not composed of parts. That's the simplest part of it. Now, there are other kind of versions of it, but for our case here, it's to say that God is not composed of parts. And so I want to read this to you from a contemporary defender, James Dolzow. He writes a distinctly classical definition of the DDS. He writes, The principal claim of divine simplicity is that God is not composed of parts. Whatever is composed of parts depends upon its parts in order to be put as it is. A part is anything in a subject that is less than the whole and without which the subject would be really different than it is. Okay, hope you follow with me here. Moreover, <clears throat> the parts in an integrated whole require a composer distinct from themselves to unify them, an extrinsic source of unity. If God should be composed of parts, again, of components that were prior 
to him in being, he would be doubly dependent, first on the parts and second on the composer of parts. But God is absolute being, alone the sufficient reason for himself and all other things, and so cannot in any respect derive his being from another. Now here's the last sentence. This will probably stick with you the most. Because God cannot depend on what is not God in order to be God, theologians traditionally insist that all that is in God is God. All that is in God is God. That is the, the one takeaway I want you to, to have from this lecture, is just to see all that is in God is God. Okay, so and we'll talk about that more as we go on through. So first, our first of the triple A's is Augustine on simplicity. And again, this is a very kind of brief summation on what these guys say, okay? So, St. Augustine's reliance on this affirmation of God in his theology was the key to understanding the distinction between God and man, uncreated and created, and simple composite. Again, we've gone through those terms, right? So God, he's uncreated, he's simple. Man, he's created, and he's composite. So you see, Augustine's philosophical construct from his days as a Manichaean portrayed God as a bodily substance. He thought God had a bodily shape. And this is what he writes in his Confessions. He says, I did not know that God is a spirit, a being without bulk, without limbs defined in length and breadth. For bulk is less in the part than in the whole, and it is infinite. It is less in any, oh, I read it wrong, sorry, for, my bad, for. Bulk is less in the part than in the whole. And if it is infinite, it is less in any part of which it can be defined within fixed limits than it is in its infinity. Sounds kind of confusing, right? But basically, think about it. Could my body be stretched around the whole world, right, and be simple? Well, I couldn't because my hand would be maybe, let's say, on the east coast, and my other hand would be on the west coast. So I'm not fully there. I'm not fully here. I'm not fully up here. My body is stretched. But, but God is everywhere present at one time, all of him, Father, Son, Spirit. So again, you can see that kind of understanding of trying to think of God as a bodily shape. I mean, just think of a long body being stretched like a, a electric, is it not electric girl? Uh, elastic girl, elastic girl, right? From the, uh, I forget the name. Anyways, but yeah, that's not God. That's not God. And that's what kind of maybe Augustine maybe thought he had in his mind. But what happened was in the study of Aristotle, which taught that man was a substance, when the scripture taught that man was made in the image of God, it led Augustine to think that God was a material substance. Now again, we're material. Everything created is material. God is not. And Augustine writes, he says, Although I did not imagine you in the shape of a human body, I could not free myself from the thought that you were some kind of bodily substance extended in space, either permeating the world or diffused in infinity beyond it. So that kind of went back to what I was saying about being stretched out. And that was the Confessions. Now, and then, then again, remember, he's, he's reflecting back on that time in the Confessions. So here he writes, he says, I therefore attempted to understand you, my God, in all your wonderful, immutable simplicity, in the same terms as though you were you too were a substance, and greatness and beauty were your attributes, in the same way that a body has attributes by which it is defined. Right? Defined. We are composite creatures. We have parts. But he says here, but your greatness and beauty are your own self. Remember our, our definition, from God. All that is God is God. Whereas a body is not great or beautiful simply because it is a body. See, so for Augustine, the grounding of his trust in God, though he had thought of God as a material body, was that he was immutable. Right? That's a big part of it. He says, with all my heart, I believe that you could never suffer decay or hurt or change. Because what is subject to decay is inferior to that which is not. He says, the single truth was the only weapon with which I could try to drive from my, eye, my mind's eye all the unclean images which swarm before it. So in his affirmation of divine simplicity, he understands that God is not just good, rather he is goodness itself. And that's God's will and power are of God himself. Again, all that is God is God. It's from him. Actually, yeah, so all that is in God is God. And that's the chief part here that nothing is given to God. Everything that he is comes from himself, okay? And we'll kind of, again, we'll, we'll go through that more as we continue. So if it isn't apparent to you yet, what I want you to observe in Augustine and in classical theism as a whole 
is that divine simplicity is divine substance. It's the essence of deity, the essence of God. And it constitutes all the goodness, holiness, beauty, and every other splendid aspect of God as God. And again, our mantra of it is again, all that is in God is God. All that is in God is God. Now we're going to talk, to, talk about Anselm on simplicity. So in his work, Prologium, Anselm professes that God is God through God. Kind of goes with our theme, right? He writes, but undoubtedly, whatever you are, you are through nothing else than yourself. And then he lists a few of God's attributes, life, wisdom, goodness, righteousness, and establishes the point that God does not have these attributes as if they were something given to him. Rather, these attributes originate in God's very nature. He is what he is through himself. Because God is who he is through his self-existent self, he cannot be made up of parts. Because <clears throat> something that is composed of parts is not whole. Thus, whatever is comprised of parts has a part giver. If that is the case, then God is not who he is through himself. He can't be made of parts. Rather, it's the parts that make up God. The parts that are who God is make God. Thus, the parts are greater than God. And if God is made of these parts, and then then uh, Anselm's famous ontological argument falls, right? Because having a parts eliminates God as supreme being. Why is that? Because there is now greater than him who can be conceived. It's the part giver. Make sense? <clears throat> so Anselm writes, For whatever is composed of parts is not altogether one, but is in some sort plural and diverse from itself, and either, in fact, of in concept is capable of dissolution, but you, he's speaking about God now, but you are so truly a unitary being. Life and wisdom and the rest are not parts of you, but all are one. Each of these is the whole, which you are in which all that rest are. So what is the, the key point here for Anselm and all of classical thought, theology is that all that is in God is God. And then he says, therefore you alone, O Lord, are what you are, and you are he who you are. God's omnipresence, according to Anselm, means that time and location exist in him because nothing contains you, he says. You contain all. See, nothing can have existence apart from God. Therefore, all that exists must be in God by participation, not ontologically speaking. So we as creatures, right, we have our own essence. There's the divine essence, and then there's the creaturely essence. So we cannot uh, exist in God as his essence, right? Otherwise, we would be God, and he can't exist in us as a created essence. Otherwise, it would make him a creature. So we participate in him, and that's where the, the Spirit comes and brings us into communion with God so that we, by our natures, can participate with God in a relational sense. Now, that participation uh, as as God's uh, as God's children is different than obviously than just regular creation. There's a standpoint where creation exists, or, I'm sorry, participates in God's being because God what He sustains all that there is. But those who us who are believers, we participate by an act of grace by the Spirit, which is a more relational, even triune uh, type of of relation. Obviously, we're we're creatures, we're not divine, so we can't share in that, but we participate in Father, Son, Spirit, in our, <clears throat> our relationship with God. So in God, there can never be past, present, or future, but only present existence. For Anselm, his reflection on God as this perfectly good, simple, and greatest being leads to affection and adoration. Such contemplation on God through the Lord Jesus heightens the heart of affection for God. And he says here in his proslogium with a, a doxology, Faithful God, I ask, I will receive that my joy may be full. Meanwhile, let my mind meditate upon it. Let my tongue speak of it. Let my heart love it. Let my mouth talk of it. Let my soul hunger for it. Let my flesh thirst for it. Let my whole being desire it until I enter into thy joy. O Lord, who are three and the one God, blessed forever and ever. Amen. See, that's what simplicity should do for us, is that because God is so much not who we are. His, his existence, his transcendence, his imminence, uncreated being is so grand. We don't have words to explain what we really want to say or can say. We don't have words for it. 
And that should make God's coming down to us that much more amazing. That should that should cause our hearts and our minds to swell with just utter utter awe that the God of this world who is uncreated, right, who is not like us, took on flesh and came upon us and came with us and he's still in the flesh. So the uncreated being has attached himself to a created being and he's that way for eternity. For eternity future, God will always be united to his his elect, his chosen one. So it's just a glorious truth to to revel in. In his other famous work, Monologium, Anselm meditates on the being of God grounded in the force of reason, which he argues is not at all inconsistent with the early church fathers, especially St. Augustine. So one thing Anselm does is he kind of, he argues as God as being the supreme being, and he tries to work through it by reason, by, by deductive argumentation, that kind of thing, to, to kind of climb, not climb up, but really to arrive at the this, this supreme perfect being. He says, <clears throat> In his meditation on God as a being whom is best and greatest in the highest of all beings. That's what he says. Right? And in God being this perfect class of being, that means that all their goods must be good through the one best good being. So again, you can see his argumentation here, right? He's making a, the same point of God is perfect. All other goods that are good must be good from this one good. So all that is good must come from a source of goodness, right? This being who is supremely good must be good through itself. Otherwise, there's something before him, before this being, that gave him this goodness that he gave on to something else, so on and so forth. So track with that. Again, must be good through itself is the doctrine of divine simplicity, and it must surpass all other existing beings. And so Anselm writes, whatever is then... <clears throat> Excuse me. Whatever is, then does not exist except through something. Since this is true, either there is one being, or there are more than one through which all things are exist. So the problem is what's happened is you get an infinite regress. So he says, but if there are more than one, we are forced to look back to a greater being. We have the one being, but then we have to keep looking back from another being, and another being, the one that gave goodness, and goodness, and goodness, and so on and so forth. So again, you have this regress. If three beings exist separately, each through itself, there is at any rate some power or property existing through self by which they are able to exist each through itself. But there can be no doubt that in that case, they exist through this very power, which is one. So again, we're talking about the three distinct persons of the Trinity. He says, well, there still has to be one. We can't have, th we can't have three distinct beings because there's still something else that gave them this existence, this being, this goodness, this power. So he says here, his point is that it is beyond reason to think that three distinct perfect beings can exist through themselves. And everything exists from them because if that were the case, then they could not be distinct unless there is something distinguishable between them, which would render, render them what? Less than the other. Rather, they must be one because they are the source that all exists. Because if you have three beings, right, as the faulty argument goes, right, they cannot be equal the same because there has to be a distinction. What distinguishes three beings if they are perfectly exactly the same? Nothing. Nothing. So going by reason, right, by deduction, we go back to there must be one source behind all that exists for the highest degree of perfection. Therefore, there is one being, one supreme being above all. Anselm's really, really good. Now we're going to move to Aquinas on simplicity. <clears throat> so he is, he stressed that the DDS was fundamental to our understanding of God, and I hope you've already been seeing that. Therefore, is the most important of attributes of God. Now again, I've already said that, so I believe that simplicity is the existence. Sorry, simplicity is the divine essence. Now again, it is an attribute, and it's right to say that. But I think ultimately, when you read the arguments, that the force of the logic is you have to go back to like Anselm that what, what dis, dis, distinguishes God as the perfect being is his simplicity, is his simplicity, okay? So, but Aquinas took this doctrine further than those who had come before him, addressing the issue of distinctions between the persons, right? He's looking at it from the same point as, how can we say God is one, but three, and not somehow, you know, mess up the structure here of understanding that God is not three, three is a triad, not a triad. And Aquinas is trying to work, work through that. So, because God is beyond our positive knowing, Aquinas discussed how God is not, which is called apophatic theology, as I talked about, also known as the via negativa, 
So via negativa really just means negative, right? So we're we're making these neg negative statements about God, saying what he is not in order to uh, articulate the ineffability of him, right? So we're using language, <coughs> the language that we have, to say what God is not so we can say something about him and not say anything that's, that's wrong, right? Because that is the ultimate problem is that we start using human terms to, des to describe and speak about God then we have a real problem with our language there and we start speaking more about what about a creature and we're trying to safeguard ourselves from that god is the same as his essence nature whereas a human is not the same as his humanity now again aquinas is trying to talk about the distinctions about god compared to humans so god's divinity and essence are inseparable thus there is no form of god apart from god whereas there is a form of humanity apart from individual instances of a human so think about this. If a human dies, does humanity cease to exist? It does not. Is it necessary that humans exist? No, it isn't, right? Because we have a, there's a form of our humanity, but it's apart from individual instances. There is a humanness, but every single person does not amount to or equal humanity, the form of it, right? So with God, there's only one divine essence, one form. If that form does not exist, that means God doesn't exist, and existence itself doesn't exist. It has to exist. But if I pass away, it doesn't mean the, the form of humanity is gone. Why is that? Because God must exist. And so therefore, this is what we conclude, God has his own life and his own Godhead, and whatever else is predicated of him. And since God is the first being, nothing can come prior to him. All composites are posterior to their parts, therefore God is simple, right? So we are made of parts. The parts of who we are make up who, who, we, who we are as people. God doesn't have parts, right? Therefore, otherwise, there would be a part giver. So therefore, God is simple. All that is in God is God. So simplicity and the Trinity. So the challenge in reconciling the DDS with the Trinity is due to the, the kind of reasoning behind it. One plus one plus one equals one. As you can see, that's a challenge, right? So modern Trinitarianism has pulled away from the DDS, <coughs> focusing more on the divine persons constituting the one God instead of the traditional one God consisting of three persons, right? So you say, we'd say one God either um, with three modes of being, uh, three, I'm sorry, one God, three modes, as John Webster would say. We could also say one God um, instantiating himself as three three persons. It's kind of different language, but ultimately, there's the, the persons, right? And then there's the being. And we always want to kind of understand that distinction. But here's the thing. But simplicity actually enables us to argue for God's triunity, maintaining the distinction of relation, okay? Yet in a non-composite sense. Relations within the Godhead are real proper relations, not accidents. So again, so, so accidents are things added, right? So to me as a person... Brown hair is added to my humanness, right? I don't need to have brown hair to be human. I don't need to have yellow hair, just like my eyes, just like having intelligence or not having intelligence, right? Those are accidents. There's a humanness that's basic to who I am, but that my hair, if my hair is gone, my humanity doesn't exist or doesn't cease to exist, right? So that would be an accident. God doesn't have any accidents, right? Otherwise, those would be what? Parts. God is who he is through himself, so he's a non-composite. But see, we're talking about relations with God, which is not a composite, and we're going to get to that. So, real quick here, simplicity negates a composition in God, not true distinctions in God, okay? Distinctions and compositions are different, okay? So thus, the divine relations subsist in themselves, and as the subsistent relations are the subsistent persons themselves, with the Father as the paternal, the Son is the filiation and the Spirit as the procession. And I'm sure Dr. Rachel has gone through those. But again, relations doesn't mean composition. Okay, Relations subsist in themselves, and I'll talk about that a little bit here in a minute. So, the perfect perfection of each Godhead, sorry, the perfection of each person of the Godhead guarantees that they are uncompounded, thus remaining simple. Right? Because so if they are actual distinctions in a standpoint to where they are parts, then God is no longer a simple God. He is a partite God. He's three divine beings. And we're trying to get away from that and articulate how we believe in a triune God, yet we are monotheists. Okay? 
So the relations subsist in the undivided being of God. Thus they relate as supposita. So supposita is a scholastic term, which basically what it relates to is a supposita is a self-subsistent nature in the undivided being of God. So we are supposites as people. We are self-subsistent nature in ourselves, right? But but we're retaining the nature. We have a distinct being, though, from others, right? But God doesn't. But he has these self-subsistent natures in the undivided being of God. So, and here's, here's the point. If the persons of the triune God possessed being as a distinct, distinct entity as we do, okay, there would be three beings, thus three gods, making God what? A composite. There'd be parts in the being of God. So it is important to differentiate being from relations in a taxonomic sense, meaning categories, right? So being from relations, it's important that we understand that. And that the divine being does not itself relate because the relations subsist in the undivided being. So here's an example, kind of cheesy, but those those Russian dolls that all stack inside, right? So there's, let's just say we have one, and then there's three that stack inside of them, okay? We still see this one, but there's three, right? There's three relations going on inside that one stack. And again, obviously, you still have a, it still breaks apart because you still have the, the, the stack on the outside to discuss about, but I'm trying to trying to make it simple in a simple uh, discussion here. So, it's important. So God is simple. So we cannot think of each person as a proper part of God or the relations as accidents. Again, something added to God that's that he didn't have to begin with, right? <clears throat> As they are in composite beings like us, like I was saying, right? They are each fully divine and each person expresses not a part of God's nature, but the fullness of the usia, the fullness of the being of God. And therefore the divine relations subsist in virtue of their identity with God's essence. So the essence of God, his simple essence, right? The relations subsist in virtue of their identity as God's essence. There's only one divine being. Right, but there's the relations that subsist within the being of God. They said they they are not parts of it. Right, they manifest the fullness of it. So the persons are numerically distinct, but conjoined in unity of essence, in which the Godhead then indicates the the communicability of the soul, infinite, individual, and singular divine essence to these three without division. So. The DDS maintains a strict monotheism, even implying it, removing any hint of tritheism or Sabellianism in the Godhead. Categorical errors arise when one strains anthropomorphism into a, a literalistic fashion when speaking of the divine persons. The scripture is full of this kind of language because God is incomprehensible beyond our understanding. And while we can use that kind of language to speak of God because we dialogue about him from what we know of creatures, Apophatic statements, as simplicity entails, provide a direction to speak truth about God and his triunity without pulling the Godhead apart. Now, I want to get to the end here as we now look at the biblical foundation for simplicity. And obviously, this is a very important piece. You want to be able to understand it from Scripture. But just like the doctrine of the Trinity, we, we formulate this doctrine by, by looking at other texts that speak about the various attributes of God, and we put them together in a sense of deductive deductive logic in a sense, right? Saying that all of these things make up who God is. So these are these divine truths that we know who they are, the, know who God is through, lead us to a doctrine of divine simplicity. So I'm thinking of spirituality, aseity, immutability, passability, infinity. So we're going to go through some of these in the brief time that I have left. So so at John, in John 4, 24, right, Jesus is talking to the woman, woman at the well. And he says, God is spirit, and those who worship him must worship in spirit and truth. And I already mentioned that a little while ago. In a discussion with the Samaritan woman, he was actually kind of giving her a correction about the location of worship. That was, that was the issue. And there's a, a, a sharp distinction between Jews and Samaritans, both claiming each one's place was the proper home of worship. But he dismisses them, right? It's not about location. They don't have to go to a, a particular place. They don't have to go to a temple. He says, worship is grounded in the understanding that God is spirit. Because he's spirit, he's everywhere present. He dwells in the hearts of his children, right? He's all over the world. He is fully triune God everywhere at the same time, always, never moving away from it. Always. Father's in the spirit. It's mind-blowing. Yes, it is. But only a simple guy. Remember, if God was parts, 
He couldn't have part of him over here and part of him there. He has to be everywhere at once to truly be omnipresent. Only a simple being can do that. And God is, he's uncreated, uncreated, eternal spirit. He has what we'd say an, an immaterial essence. And so therefore, his spirituality entails an uh, omnipresence, as I was saying, right? And think about Acts 28. This is a great text here. It says, in him we live and move and have our being, right? So we are within God. We participate with God. We don't share in his divine essence. But for God to be everywhere present, right? Therefore, it's us who are in him and live and move and have our being. And we speak of his infiniteness, right? So his infiniteness of his being means there is no place, nor height, nor depth that God's infinite divine essence does not fully and completely dwell. <clears throat> All right, let's jump down here to... I want to go to... A seity and infinity. Scripture demonstrates God's independence, or to use a Latin phrase, a seity, which means he is of himself, and Hebrews 1.3 tells us that he sustains all things by the word of his power, or the power of his word. And John 5.26 says what? He has life in himself. And then Romans 11.36 says, For from him and through him and to him are all things. What does that sound like? Sounds like divine simplicity. Right? The London Baptist Confession, section 2.2, supports simplicity, stating, God has all life, glory, goodness, and blessedness in and of himself. He alone is all sufficient in himself. So he's the source of all that exists, the source of life and goodness and everything, right? If God doesn't have these aspects from himself, but rather as something conferred or bestowed upon him, then God is made of parts, and we would need to look for a greater being prior to God. We would not be able to declare the Lord is great and highly praised. His greatness is unsearchable in Psalm 145.3. Nor could we say in Psalm 147.5, our Lord is vast. Or sorry, our Lord is great, vast in power. His understanding is infinite. So God's infinity entails that he must be simple and who he is through himself. Because if there were multiple infinities, then those infinities would be parsed and differentiated, thus being parts of God instead of God being all that he is in his singular plentitude. God is infinite, excuse me, and there could be only one actual infinite being because two infinite beings would what? They would lack being proper to the other because they would need to have an aspect that differentiates one from the other, right? There has to be a difference between multiple infinities to distinguish one from the other. Right? So if there is some kind of distinguishing mark, then there are not truly infinitely great. One lacks something else just to differentiate. So unfortunately for today, I had to skip a, a good amount of some really good stuff here. But I, I hope that what I covered today is very helpful for you. Uh, most importantly, for your, just your foundation, your bread and butter theology of classical theism. I hope it's kind of opened up your eyes to the importance of the doctrine of divine simplicity. Um, and say this, that uh, the complex nature of the discussion throughout these previous paragraphs is mentally contortive. However, discussion about the Trinity and maintaining monotheism and the attributes of God, as found in Scripture, pushes the envelope in our theological discourse to a level of precision that, though challenging to grasp and articulate, it is needed in, in order to maintain the coherency and constancy of the biblical data of the Christian doctrine of God. And that is where philosophy must come back to, to buttress theology and Holy Scripture, where God has revealed himself as creator, Revelations 4.11, as the I Am in Exodus 3.14, and as the triune God in John 1.1. 1, 1. I said here, I mentioned a few books as well. So to really get in the subject, I recommend reading All That Is In God by James Dolezal. I know it's probably backwards in your screen, but very, very good primer. And if you want to kind of really get down in the nitty gritty, uh, his dissertation called God Without Parts. Again, his name is James Dolezal. Uh, Dr. Wraith will be able to direct you if you need to find those. I know he knows these. And then the and I was mentioning about my, my thesis earlier. So Thomas J. Ord, if you haven't heard of him, this is the book that he wrote uh, a few years back. Got a, a very, very... Um, provocative book called The Uncontrolling Love of God, An Open and Relational Account of Providence, written by IVP, and this actually got Reader's Choice Award. So ideas are pretty radical. Uh, Dr. Ord here has been, and some, my name is Orr, it's Ord for him. But anyways, 
speaking engagements all over the world. Uh, people really interested in his, his ideas. Uh, so much so that these one of the uh, the the, the multi-view books that have come out, you've probably seen these. The last two to come out, Dr. Ord, uh, Thomas J. Ord, has been in both of these. One on divine impassibility, he has one of the views there, and then God in the problem of evil. The reason he's in this one is because in his book that came out before this, he says he has provided the solution to the problem of evil, and I'll let you guys read that if you want to. So. Uh, again, I, I thank you for your time. Again, I hope it was helpful. Uh, Dr. Rachel, thank you again. I appreciate it. And you guys take care and God bless.